Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are gathered together in um, remarkable numbers this afternoon uh, to share in a, a special conversation uh, brought to you by the Zamir Coral Foundation, uh, bringing together Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer and Maestro Matthew Lazar, uh, whom I will say a few words about in a moment. To introduce myself, my name is Jerry Skolnick. I'm the rabbi of the Forest Hills Jewish Center and I'm honored and proud to serve also as a vice president of the Zamir Coral Foundation and to be um, the moderator slash host of this remarkable event. This afternoon, I have the opportunity to present two very precious friends. Uh, first of all, Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer um, truly might fall into the category of the person who needs no introduction but I'm gonna introduce her anyway. Uh, she is a psychosexual therapist who pioneered the field of media therapy. She's the author of 40 books. She's been an adjunct professor at Teachers College of Columbia University and Hunter College for several years. She's held visiting appointments at Princeton, Yale, and NYU. And this coming October, God willing, she's going to receive the first honorary doctorate that she has received in Israel. She's received a number in America, but she'll be receiving one in Israel from the Ben-Gurion University in the Negev. And um, I would add, Dr. Ruth, I don't even know that you'll remember this, but we've known each other about 35 years. And actually this weekend was the anniversary of when we met because it was on the Shabbat on which we read the portions of Tazria and, and I gave a sermon in my synagogue, which you happened to be in that morning because you knew the family of the Bar Mitzvah. And I spoke about the issue of AIDS in the Jewish community and how we were making people feel that they were outside of the camp. And you approached me at Kiddush. And that was, as they would say, the beginning of a long and beautiful friendship and personal and professional association. I'm delighted that you are a part of this conversation. Maestro Matthew Lazar is the founder and director of Zamir Choral Foundation. He has created the North American Jewish Choral Festival, Hazamir, the International Jewish Teen Choir, Zamir Noded and Shira, the Jewish Community Choir of the JCC on the Palisades. He has conducted choral and choral orchestral Jewish themed concerts across the United States and Israel, and has conducted the great cantors of this generation. Um, I've known uh, the maestro, whom I very affectionately call Mati, uh, for over 50 years. And I believe it was about 51 years ago that he and I sang shoulder to shoulder in the tenor section of the Zamir Chorale. He was the one with the talent though, and he moved on in music uh, <laughs> to become this remarkable impresario who has impacted the world of Jewish choral music uh, in unprecedented ways. Mati, we're delighted that you and the foundation are making this afternoon possible, uh, this remarkable conversation with you and Dr. Ruth. The subject of the conversation this afternoon is the role of music in challenging times. And um, without further ado, I'm going to turn the conversation over to Mati and Dr. Ruth. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jerry. And wait, 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 Mati. First tell Jerry the rabbi is <laughs> wrong. I absolutely remember the conversation about AIDS. And I remember that I brought him to my radio program at NBC, WYNY, and, y, and he was brilliant. And we have been friends ever since. Now you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't there, but I'll believe you. <laughs> uh, Masla, thank you, Jerry, again. Uh, and uh, do, what are you now, Ruthie? You're Dr. 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 Ruth? Now that soon. you have these doctorates. Soon, soon, soon. <laughs> yes. Uh, Ruth, you've had and continue to have a fascinating life. And it's a life that was also often filled with challenges along the way. 
And I know that you've often met those challenges with music. Could you share with us, what are some of the ways in which music has helped you in some difficult times? Mm -hmm. So first of all, for an orphan of the Holocaust like myself, who was sent to Switzerland in 1939, and I stayed in an orphanage for six years, otherwise I would not be alive. Uh, um, because the kinder transport to Holland, Belgium and France, those children did not make it. The one to England uh, did make it and the one to Switzerland where I was with it. And to your specific question, there is no question in my mind that my remembering and my being uh, so clear about my first years in Frankfurt am Main in an Orthodox Jewish family, that I do remember the melodies from the synagogue. Also, I was an only child. Even so I was a girl, I was able to go with my father to synagogue every Friday night. He put a little money in the vest pocket of his jacket just for an ice cream. Mati, I can still taste the flavor of that ice cream going to synagogue with my father. Sadly, when they made the sacrifice to send me to Switzerland, none of them, not my grandmother, not the other grandfather, not my other grandmother, not my parents, nobody made it. But I'm anchored in the tradition of that Jewish upbringing and that helped me to survive, particularly the melodies of my childhood. Well, music can certainly connect us to our memory, our emotional life. It can therefore be a source of comfort, of inspiration, sometimes defiance, sometimes catharsis, sometimes it's an escape as well. What do you think it is about music that allows it to have such a power, a useful power most often? So first of all, when I was on the train, January 5th, 19, 39, just before the outbreak of World War II, we were all very sad. But I did what my father did when the Nazis picked him up. I waved so that my mother and grandmother shouldn't be sad. The children on the train were sad and I made them, I was 10 and a half. There were some younger, some little older. I made them sing in order to give us a little bit of that comfort that music brings. We sang the music from the synagogue. We sang the children's songs of Germany. And we sang everything. I tell you something. I remember it was a long train ride. It went through Basel and then Switzerland. I remember we had to sing the songs three times because we ran out of new songs. And I do remember that those melodies were so strong that it helped us to overcome the sadness. Otherwise, all of us, 300 German Jewish children in that train to Switzerland in that kinder transport, all of us would have cried from Frankfurt through Basel to Switzerland. So music, I can even remember the songs we sang. And since all of us were from Orthodox Jewish background, I do remember those melodies from the synagogue. What, do you remember any of the secular music that you uh, heard when you were a young child in, uh, uh, in, uh, when you were living on the Bramstrasse? First of all, you say that very nicely, Bramstrasse. The whole region where I lived in Frankfurt am Main, for some strange reason, had names of composers. I lived on Bramstrasse. I remember Beethovenstrasse, Schillerstrasse, all kind, Haydn. Now, when you ask me about a melody of those years, I have to tell you something a little sad. I do remember, and it's in my head, the melody of he from Haydn. And I do remember that the Nazis, you mach schon, 
that the Nazis took the, those melodies and made a song, Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, Germany, Germany over everything. For some reason, because of my strong background, I didn't permit the Nazis to take away the melody. They already took away my parents. They already made me an orphan. I didn't let them take away the melodies, but when I hear the words, I put in the new words and not the Nazi words, of course. So I do remember the, the songs, even when I was like in kindergarten, there was a lot of German Jewish songs. There is one song, Nati, that talks, that is translated into Hebrew. Jonathan Hakatan. Uh, that's called Henson Klein. Can you sing it with me? No, I'd like you to sing it. All right. I told you I don't sing well, but you forced me. You said everybody can sing. One, two, three. Henson Klein ging allein in die weite Welt hinein. Stock und Hut steht im Gut, ist gar wohlgemut. Then it says, but he went, his mother was very sad because she wanted Henschen to be with her. And sadly, he came back, good for him, but I could never come back. So whenever I hear that song or when I sing it, even in Hebrew, Yohanan, Hakatan, Halach Lagan, Al Etzim Hutipes, Efrochim Hutipes, I do remember the melody, but sadly, I could not go back to my parents. So it still provided comfort because the melody is catching and the melody was sung to me by my parents and grandmothers. Mati, I just want to interject for a minute that people who want to ask questions, don't unmute yourself, but you can do them in the chat. Okay, thank you. I like the rabbi's beard. Tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you just did. <laughs> Thank you. Ruth, it's, you, were, you were brought up in an Orthodox uh, family. And so you went to shul with your father, as you said. Uh, what are your favorite songs? I know one of your favorite songs that you still remember by Lewandowski. Of course, I'm talking about Tzadik Tamar. But what, are, uh, what other melodies do you remember fondly or remember as a source of comfort uh, from your shul going with your father? I, I particularly remember that every Friday night after synagogue, we went home and my father, who must have had a nice voice, because I can hear still the voice. I don't know how come I have such an awful singing voice. He sang uh, Sholem Aleichem for Friday night. And he particularly sang uh, the welcoming the Sabbath and Lecho Daudi. Now I say it in Ashkenazit, not like you say it. Lecho Daudi, Lekras Kala, Pene Shabbat, Lekabala. And when I hear those melodies, I am like consoled. I will never forget that I was an orphan, but I'm consoled. Now I have to tell you something. There are some cantors in New York. Um, uh, uh, one, one is the cantor at Park East Synagogue, have got, the other one is Malavani. When they see me, when I go to Park East, uh, the, the cantor sings Sadi Katome in the Frankfurt am Main Nigun. Even so, he's a Hasid. He sings it for me. Malavani, I make him, sing, make him sing it, even in, in the streets of Jerusalem. Whenever I see him, he knows already he has to sing Tzadik Katome by Lewandowski. Ruthie, every cantor that you know, and every rabbi that you know, knows that if you're around them, there's a good chance you're going to ask them to sing the Lewandowski Tzadik Katome. So, you too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't ask about questions about sex, you know that. I keep that separately. However, for us Jews, Mati, that's why I could be a sex therapist. Sex has never been a sin. 
it always has been a mitzvah, a good deed, an obligation for Friday night for a husband, not just anybody, for a husband to have sex with his wife. So all of the people who are listening to us right now, who have a partner, don't just pick up somebody, who have a partner. And I want you to make believe that it's Friday night. And I want you to say, Eshet Chayil Miyimtza, a woman of valor who can find, and towards the end, Mati, is one sentence that in my profession is the best advice to anybody about sex. It says, the husband says to his wife, there are wonderful women out there. They all do good work. But you, my wife, he has to say, you are the very best. In the entire literature about sexuality, there is no sentence that can be like this sexually arousing than a husband saying, you are the very best. And that's why I can talk about sex. <laughs> and it's even better when someone is singing those words. Because Let then, me hear you sing it. Oh, no, I do it on Friday night, next Friday okay. night. What are you okay. doing? All right. <laughs> Don't forget that one sentence. I think we all remember that. <laughs> you, re you mentioned to me that not only did you did your father say all these preliminary prayers before you had the meal, but at the end of the meal, you would also uh, bless the meal and would bench. And I remember that this was the way, yes, <laughs> and I would remember that this was the way in which I persuaded you that you could in fact sing. I locked you in a car, we were driving, yes. and I asked you to start the benching, and as you proved to everyone with your henchen Klein just recently, you really can sing, and everybody can sing. I'd like to, go ahead. Go ahead. I want to go to uh, your, the next phase that you kind of anticipated about that terrible train ride uh, to Switzerland where you were able to galvanize your, your fellow friends and people you didn't know with the power of music to chase away the devil within and the devil without. What else do you remember at the music that you learned in Switzerland, in, in Haydn, in the children's home? So the wonderful thing in Haydn that the, the orphanage had very little money, very little uh, toys, very little games. But we went on nature walks every Shabbat. And what do you do on a walk in the nature in the Swiss mountains? You sing. So we learned the songs of Switzerland. I knew even as a young girl, 11 years old I already, knew that I cannot stay in Switzerland that this is only, they rescued me, but I have to go someplace else. Fortunately, there were Shlichim from then Palestine who talked to us about that country. I didn't know about that in Frankfurt. There was something, Shana Abab Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. That didn't mean any Zionism, but I became an ardent Zionist in Switzerland and I said, where these good-looking guys are, that's where I want to go, but on a serious note. I then was already 14, 15, 16. I knew that I have to help to build a country for Jews so that this, what happened to me, will never happen again. And that's why I went in 1945 on the first ship that went from Switzerland to then Palestine. I did not know that I would be a sniper. I didn't know that I, I knew that I would learn the songs of Israel. Anu Oli Marza, live not for Liba Notba. Arza Alinu. Arza Alinu, let's sing it. Arza Alinu, Arza Alinu, Arza Alinu. You taught me that people like me can sing even if they don't have wonderful voices. I could not sing in your choir. And I love the Zamir, the children, the Hazamir. And I could not sing with them, but later we have a surprise what I can do. Later, don't tell them now. Okay, I'm glad you just raised it as a hint. <laughs>
What about Ushafte Maim? I know that that was a favorite song of yours because it combined the singing and one of your true loves, which is dancing. Right. We danced every Friday night, almost the whole night. We danced the horror. I still love to dance. I can't dance as much anymore. I love to dance with my daughter Miriam, who is a big dancer. As you know, she danced in one of your programs. And we danced in then Palestine every Friday night. And then on Saturday, my task was to clean the toilets. So I cleaned the toilets. So I remember dancing, not sleeping, and cleaning toilets in the kibbutz. <laughs> Ruthie, while you were still in Switzerland, is that where you first got a chance to learn some classical music, meaning Mozart? It was, we had an awful director of the home. She was a refugee herself. She was not a pedagogue. She was not a learned uh, teacher. She told us that our parents were awful because they sent us away instead of saying they sacrificed uh, by letting us be in Switzerland. But she did one thing. She was a very educated woman from Berlin, not Orthodox, but Berlin. And she did teach us literature and she also taught us classical music. I think eine kleine Nachtmusik by Mozart. Little night music that came from those years. I once asked Zubin Mehta, I asked him, why do I love that? He said, because it's complete. It's short like me <laughs> and it's complete. It has a beginning, a middle and an end. So I have to say, despite the fact that she was a terrible educator, a terrible pedagogue, she was cultured. She read us books. She showed us movies, How Green Was My Valley, all those movies that had hope in them. And that's what I want to say to all of your people at the Zamir Foundation. Music can give you comfort. If you had a boyfriend who dropped you, there are plenty of songs about guys who dropped their friends. I can teach you another time about those. And, but music can lift you and console you. And that's what's very important these days too. And we are going to have a wonderful concert with the Hazamir and the Zamir and I'll be there, of course. You uh, mentioned to me once that uh, in reference to this woman who wasn't a pedagogue, but introduced you to classical music, that that was where you learned the idea that music should not be interrupted with conversation. That, that, uh, it, that music, uh, if conversation is a distraction. And uh, was there another time that you learned that same lesson in Palestine? Yes, I have to tell you that in my area of specialty, which we are not discussing today, but in all of that, I do not believe that people should have that uh, occupation, that sex <laughs> uh, with music. When they have sex, they should have sex. They should concentrate on giving pleasure and on having pleasure. When they listen to music, they should concentrate on the music and let their thoughts and feelings fly. And let, them, let the thoughts kind of uh, console you and, and, and hug you by saying things will be better. That's particularly also important for today. That people have to have, I think it should be mandatory, to have a Marty Lazar on every street corner teaching about the importance of music. And you have a special talent because you can put it into history. When you talk about salsa, or any of the other cantors, uh, it makes even more sense. You did tell me though, Ruth, thank you very much. You did tell me that you used to use music sometimes unbeknownst to yourself, like when you were skiing. <laughs> yes. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> I, want to, I was a super good skier. I started skiing in Switzerland 
And then later when I married Fred Westheimer, who loved to ski, and my children are good skiers. So I one time went skiing with Joel, my son, with Miriam, my daughter. And I said to Miriam, there is a tune. I'm uh, singing to myself when I go down these steep slopes. I don't know how come. I now know why. Instead of worrying, can I make that turn? Can I make that turn? The music, Sachki Sachki Al Chalomot, I don't know why that one, but it has a rhythm. And that rhythm, by my singing to myself, helped me to become a super good skier because then you kind of block the other thoughts of falling, I'm going to fall, I'm not going to make the turn. You block that out by singing. I didn't even realize that then Miriam said to me, that's the song Sachki Sachki Al Chalomon. It's by Chernichovsky. Tell them what it is. Sachki Sachki Al Chalomon. Ki ani ha cholem sach. So you, you just proved the point uh, this very second that I want to expand upon for a second because it's relevant to my having persuaded you and I think everyone else who's heard you sing that you can sing. But the reason people think they can not sing is because they try to imitate the key in which someone else has started singing. And that can be fatal because that's where people can't quite figure out where they are. They sing too high, too low and they imitate the range of the person who's singing. So when I started singing Sachki, when you continued the song, it wasn't as perfect as you could make it if you had started singing it. Because when, you, when anyone who thinks they can't sing, if they start the song in their own individual, private, personal key, they will be able to sing. So I want to clarify that. Ruthie, I want to, I want to bring your, your memory back to uh, your time in Palestine at the very moment when Palestine became changed by name to the Jewish state of Israel. And what First of all, <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. Look what I have. <laughs> I have four de Galim. Can you see them? You do. Can they all see them? One for each one of my grandchildren. One for Ari, one for Leora, one for Michal, and one for Ben because in a few days is Yom Ha'atzma'ut. And I do remember, Mati, that I was in Jerusalem the night that David Ben-Gurion declared the state of Israel despite the fact some people told him not to do it. I danced the whole night on a truck and I did not know that right after that I would be trained as a in the Haganah, in the underground, wasn't an act of heroism on my part. Everybody, they either went to Haganah or they went to some other units of the army. I, for some reason, became a sniper. I know, Rabbi Skolnik, I know, still know how to get five bullets into that little red circle. I've never killed anybody. Thank God, but I could have. <laughs> Don't start now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, if, if I may, uh, Mati and Ruth, I'd like to um, inject a question or two that's been brought uh, to my attention via chat. Mm -hmm. Ruth, uh, Mary, before you, before you continue with that, which is uh, exactly what we're up to, uh, to all our, our listeners and our viewers, I want to mention that at the end, of, there's a wonderful book that Ruth has written. And it's called, Musically Speaking, it's published by the University of Pennsylvania Press. It's, it's still available. It's still available. Uh, and I'm dancing with Zubin Mehta. <laughs> by pen, at penpress.org. And the main thing about this book, uh, and I want to get there before the questions, is first of all, you'd find out a tremendous amount uh, more fascinating information and wonderful heartwarming stories and some sobering stories that Ruth shares about her life. But at the very end of the book, 
Ruth has, you have a, a, a homework assignment. Yes. That's really some advice. Could, I want I, to say it to your listeners now. Everybody can write a book like this. Everybody can write a book about the music in their lives. And that's what people should do in difficult times like today. Uh, Jeff Tabak, a good friend of Miriam and mine, an attorney, he had a brilliant idea. He said to me, when he hears a song from his high school, he still remembers what he felt. And I'm telling all of your people who love Zamir and Hazamir, as of tonight, sit down and write a little essay about the music in your life. Everybody can do that. This is not something that only a Dr. Ruth can do. Ruthie, you mentioned, and one of the first points of contact for us is that we both know that when we hear music, and I'm not exaggerating, when we hear music that we shared with our fathers, we can, if we close our eyes, still feel our father's hands on our I own do. hands. Mati, I, when I talk about Sadik Katoma, which you're going to show them later, I can feel the hand of my father walking with me on Friday night, and I can taste the ice cream. The hand of my father is in the feeling and the taste of that ice cream he bought me. Uh, I'm going to try one more time. I'm going to get it. <laughs> um, Good luck to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Ruth, I, I think as much as any person that I know, and, and obviously my friendship with Mati is the primo example of this, you have a deeply intuitive relationship with music and its power. Uh, it flows from your experience as a child, from the role that music has played with you, and you just sort of alluded to it in that story about the power of music to take you back to what it felt like to be walking home from shul with your father. One of our listeners this afternoon asked a question which I think is particularly sensitive to the moment in which we find ourselves, that we are separated not by choice, oftentimes, from the people that we love, family members, partners, uh, often um, spouses and, and siblings and grandparents who may be ill and we can't even get to be with them in their illness. And the questioner asked, um, given your deep appreciation of music, how does music afford us the opportunity to bond with people mm -hmm. from whom we're separated against our will? Right. So first of all, very sad, especially for people who are endangered species like me. I'm going to be 92. Older people right now are endangered species. We have to listen to the authorities, but nobody has control over our thoughts. There's a song in German, Die Gedanken sind frei. Thoughts are free. Use that, please, in order to console yourself, but also make a tape and try to get a tape or the internet to those people that you cannot see right now. Maybe what you could do actually devise a new song, become a songwriter and dedicate it to that grandmother that you cannot be with right now. That would be very nice. And uh, they would appreciate that for the rest of their lives. That, that's a beautiful response. And a related question that was asked is, what's the relationship between music and hope? We are so desperately seeking hope in this time, which is bleak and, and not filled with hope. How does music factor into that? I just heard the song by this popular singer, uh, Alicia something. Keys. And, yes, bravo, see the rabbi knows. <laughs> and I just heard it and guess what? She wrote it before that awful virus and it's called Hope. Very interesting. We have to consciously say we live in 
difficult, very difficult times, but there will be an end to it. For me, for example, since I'm in that group of people that should be very careful because of my age, I'm very disciplined. I'm a Jekyll, I'm a German Jew. <laughs> Governor Como said to stay home, I'm home. My daughter doesn't let anybody visit me. Very difficult for me, but I'm listening. Yesterday, Governor Como said he's going on a hike after his talk, but he forgot to invite me. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'm staying home. <laughs> so very important to know our own limitations but do not let terrible happenings right now really get us down. But we have to be realistic. I am not going out. I'm staying home. Very difficult for me. Five weeks. And, um, but soon we are going to have dinner. You, your wife Robin, <laughs> Vivian Lazar, Moti Lazar, we are going to have dinner and they will have a drink each. <laughs> At least one. <laughs> Sounds like a plan to me, Ruth. Sounds like a great plan. Thank you. Mati, I think this might be a good time for you to, uh, to bring in our special surprise for people. Mm -hmm. uh, most of you uh, know that Ruth can sing a little um, and she can dance a lot. But when the Zamir Coral Foundation honored uh, Dr. Ruth in 2015, we had a great surprise for her. She loves Sadika Tamar so much, and she can sing it, even if she doesn't say she can, and loves having it sung to her, that the surprise when we honored her on stage at what was then Avery Fisher Hall, and you're about to see this clip of Dr. Ruth in her conducting debut, conducting Hazamir, the International Jewish Teen Choir, singing Louis Lewandowski's Sadik Katamar. So What you are doing is fabulous, unusual in this world. So tell everybody if they want to have good sex for the rest of their lives, once they get married, to get you some money for the Zamir and for the Hazamir. Did they hear that? Yes, I believe so, Ruthie. Thank you so much. Rabbi Skolnik, I want to know how much money you can make for them. <laughs> It's one great fundraising pitch, Ruth, I'll tell you that. What sex for the rest of your life? Tell your <laughs> wife all that. in my shul on Yom Kippur, I, <laughs> I'd be a wealthy rabbi. 
Listen, I, uh, first of all, um, as moderator of this program, uh, I speak for the more than, well more than 400 people who are watching. We have 400 contacts on Zoom, but there are many more people who are watching. I want to thank you so sincerely for making yourself available for this program. And Mati, of course, um, for envisioning this and for your um, enlightened and powerful and dynamic leadership of the Zamir Coral Foundation. Um, these relationships are invaluable to all of us at all times, but especially at a time such as this, when we're all looking to have our spirits lifted, you have provided us with an hour's worth of smile and of feeling good about ourselves. And it was because of the music and the sheer power of your personality and your kind comment about my beard, which I'll throw in. Wait, wait, wait. Where do they send the money? You're forgetting to tell them. I'm not done yet. Okay. okay. <laughs> if you look in the chat portion of this Zoom broadcast, there will be a link for where, which you can click on to donate to the Zamir Coral Foundation. And I want to tell you that the foundation has a $50,000 matching grant, dollar for dollar. So for every dollar that you can give, we will get a matching dollar. I need not tell you that in the current economic climate, um, all nonprofits are struggling mm -hmm. and ours is not excluded. And particularly in the arts, as people feel pinched, it's not the first place that they go to contribute. You have the capacity to take your charitable dollar and bring music, quality Jewish music, into the lives of everyone from the Haza prep kids in the upper grades of primary school, through Hazamir, through Zamir Noded, through the Zamir Chorale, through the North American Jewish Choral Festival, through all of the manifestations of great music that the Zamir Choral Foundation provides us with, you can impact us for the good. So please do find that link in the chat. We're going to keep this link open for a while so that you can look in the chat. And um, Mati and Ruth, if you have any closing words, I invite you, but I personally want to thank everyone for being on this conference. Okay, first of all, I'm going to make a contribution. No question. But I want to tell everybody, don't listen, Rabbi. Anybody who is giving some money right now, I promise good sex for the rest of your life. <laughs> Ruthie, thank you so much for sharing your, your life, the soundtrack of your life. It's so meaningful and so impactful on anyone who knows you, anyone who was listening and watching today, and on anyone who will read the book that you wrote about this experiences of your life. So thank you so much for being such a good friend to the Zamir Coral Foundation, to me and to Vivian. And Jerry, thank you so much for your elegant and heartfelt words. My pleasure. Thank you all for being with us. Find that link and take good care of yourself. Stay safe, stay inside, flatten the curve, do what you need to do to stay healthy. Thank you.